Welcome and please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. Chris, invocation, please. Thank you, President Richard. Uh, in our careers, right, we cross paths with many, many good people. And uh, over the weekend, we lost one of them. A uh, gentleman who started uh, in his career about the same time I did, uh, working as an interpreter at the Plymouth Plantation. His name is Paul Cripps, and uh, he went from an interpreter to an advocate for tourism in, in Plymouth County, Brockton being the, uh, the capital city here of Plymouth County, and then became, about 20 years ago, when I arrived here, the director of the Plymouth County Development Council and Convention and Visitors Bureau, both, and Destination Plymouth, and worked tirelessly uh, with the state, uh, with local officials, uh, with, with so many of us to promote uh, this region and in a successful way. Rooms, rooms tax rose, uh, activities rose. His gentleman did a great job. Turned 63 a short time ago and died in his sleep on Saturday morning. Can we have a moment of silence for Paul Cripps? Thank you. Bless this food to our use and us to thy service. Amen. Our first order of business, of course, is to thank our greeter. Today was Allison. Invocation, Chris Cooney. <laughs> Sergeant Brahms, our, our Tom. Tom, thank you. <laughs> Treasurer, Tina. Thank you, Tina. And Eric Lutz, Mr. Lutz, thank you for your uh, sales and please. I talked to Eric just a few minutes last night, and I said, I don't know about tomorrow's meeting, the weather and this, and uh, what should we do? And he said, oh, for God's sakes. I said, there'll probably be 10 people. Well, you showed me wrong. Not only 10 people, more than 10 people, but what a crowd. You've got some people we haven't seen for a while, um, and it's great to see you all. So thank you for coming. So that rolls us right into guests. Do we have any guests today? Guest, guest? Peter. Yes, we have Penny Ramsayer from ADP. Penny, thank you. Brian. Jeff, welcome. <laughs> Mary. So I have two guests, Jeff Miller from Signature Healthcare, <laughs> but also I have a um, patron today who's from, who is from the um, Census 2020. David Conn, Pedro, thank you. <laughs> Jeff. I have two guests as well, Suzanne Fernandez from Mutual Bank, and Nick Paulo from North East Asia. <laughs> thank you for coming. Mr. Sampson. Thank you for coming. Any other guest? Any other guest? Guest, okay. Any visiting Rotarians? Thank you, okay. Thank you. Okay, no other visiting Rotarians? Mark, yes, Mark, of course, Mark. We didn't forget you, Mark. Thank you for coming. 
Okay, uh, just a few important uh, reminders here. The, uh, our, our, our newsletter come out today, okay? There are a few on the table there, but everyone should have got your, uh, your uh, newsletter today. Uh, and like always, please read that because uh, Tom has got it so it's become um, informative for us. Uh, next Thursday's meeting is not going to be here. It's going to be our community service, and it's over on Commercial Street at the Crescent Credit Union branch, right across from the post office. We'll be up on the second floor from 11.30ish to 2, the same hours here. If you want to come early, you can. And on that day, we are uh, making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bag lunches for 100 um, uh, for Mainspring, to give uh, 100 lunches to Mainspring. So, Again, it's going to be there, and I'm, I'm sure Betty <clears throat> will be sending out some emails reminding us, but if you come here, you're on your own, uh, and we hope to see you over there uh, because we're, we are on a time frame, um, and within that hour, an hour and a half, again, 100 lunches, you know, slap on the peanut butter, the jelly, wrap it, bag it, store it, and get it over to Mainspring. So um, please keep it in mind, and uh, hope to see as many of you as we can on that day. Uh, and then, of course, our pancake breakfast that we talk about every week. Uh, it'll be here before we know it. Um, and we just want to remind all of us of, of our um, obligations, of, of our challenges. And just a reminder, I, I think Tom has done a great job in passing out uh, the uh, tickets for all of us. Uh, and we can purchase them and uh, we'll purchase them and, and use them for our own use or purchase them and, and donate them. And if you want to do that, of course, you can donate it to your own cause. And if you're not sure, you can let one of us know, and we will donate them. Uh, so uh, there's also the business cards. And uh, we've asked um, – oh, Bill, why don't you uh, take over? And let's do that. Hello, what's our deadline? What asked? We said it. No, it's next thir next Wednesday. Thursday is the 28th.
Thank you, Bill, for all you do. Leg breaker. <laughs> All right. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then one quick reminder is uh, the, 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 the pin drop uh, night, March 3rd, that Joe McCool had talked about. He's not here today to remind us, but that's March 3rd. I know there are some people who have signed up, and, and we still have uh, uh, a week or so to sign up for that. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's move right into happy. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Yeah, good. Yes. How many? Eight. 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 Great. Great. Good. Thank you, Chris. Okay, let's move into happy bucks, please. Who's happy? Susan. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Who else is happy? You're kidding, right? No one else is happy? Peter. Uh, I missed meeting last week, but last week was Valentine's Day, and that was our, my 51st anniversary of meeting my wife, blind day on Valentine's Day. And I don't forgot my pin. Uh oh. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Aki. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lutz. Uh, this is more of an apology, but uh, last week, for those of you who are here, we did the, uh, the Oldie Web game, and uh, I, I thought it was a lot of fun. And then I was looking at pictures that somebody sent me, and the, the four couples, the four couples that were up there, I looked at those pictures, and I have seen happier faces in the <laughs> <laughs> uh, They all look like they had a terrible time. We should never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Anyone else happy? Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Anyone else happy? Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, spent the last week in Puerto Rico with my, with my daughter and her family, so that was nice. a great time for us. Good. Thank you, Alex. Anyone else? Mr. Fishman. I got five happy bucks. My, my wife for uh, Christmas took me to see uh, the Beatles in uh, Providence last night. I only fell asleep for about a half hour. <laughs> 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 it was real good. <laughs> Anyone else happy? Okay, I'll, I'll end it, please. And, and, and just, you know, again, there's a lot of good things going on. Um, we have our pancake breakfast. We have our spinathon. There's a lot of good things going on, and, and, and I'm just grateful that I can be a part of that. And uh, thank you very much. Okay.
Zahlen. Ja? Okay. Winning number is 781009. 781009. Come on up. There you go. Oh, I trust you. Nine of hearts. Nine of hearts. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask Mary Waldron to come up and introduce today's speaker, please. I'm too short. Can everybody, can, can everybody, well, I know the mic. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Let me do this. Sorry, Mark, and for anybody. Oh, yeah, you're going to have to put this back up again, Kim. So, oh, aren't you glad you asked me? Anyway, um, I have the distinct pleasure of first um, putting Kim's name forward as a speaker to come before us today. Um, I was on the um, Signature Healthcare Brockton Hospital Board for six or so years. Um, it was an incredible experience. Um, and part of the team in terms of hiring him um, as a board and nominating and putting forward. Uh, the work that has been done in these short period of time, it's been eight and a half years, um, he's just been incredible. He's part of the fabric of this community and this region. Um, one of the largest employers here in the city and the region as well but again he serves on different boards and committees and um, just been a pleasure to be part of that system but some of the things that i think are really important in a short period of time no pun intended eric um, but in a short period of time he took this organization that had been very fragile um, financially, but instilled ways to still provide the quality of care that um, many of us who, who go to Signature Healthcare receive, um, and yet at the same time help that bottom line. Um, that doesn't happen very easily. It had to come from someone from Alabama, um, hopefully become a better Patriots fan and, um, um, and, and other sports yeah. fan as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but it's been my pleasure to not just only um, be part of that board in the past, but to truly call Kim a friend and glad that you are part of this community. And I welcome you here to give some remarks. So thank you for coming. Would somebody watch the time for me uh, in case I get long-winded? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Until people start walking out, I guess. Thank you for thank you for um, inviting me. You shouldn't have to invite me as a member, but and I apologize for not being here more than I've been able to uh, in the last uh, year, year and a half. I want to start uh, with a comment that this is your hospital, not Signature's hospital. This hospital got built back in the late 1800s from people that believed they needed a hospital to take care of folks in the local area. There weren't many hospitals at the time. We don't pay taxes. Our board are community members like Mary and David, and uh, we're fortunate to have the support of the community, but we know that we belong to you. Uh, so we're here to serve you. Uh, we're an asset that belongs to the community. The money we make, if there is any, we plow right back into the institution. Nobody takes any of it home, and there are no investors. And that's important, and it's important we serve you. And I'd be happy to take questions at the end and particularly hear feedback from you about how you think we can better serve this community because that is why we're here. I want to start with uh, what I think is a difficult issue, and to me the elephant in the room terms of health care because I don't think it's talked about enough and I'm sure I'm breaking a lot of marketing rules to start with a slide that says the third leading cause of death in America are errors that happen in hospitals third leading cause of death we should do more about that I think as a field as an industry I, I am a representative of that industry I think we could do more I think we should do more and we've been working hard at this issue at Signature uh, for a number of years. 
I put zero harm on there because that is our aim, is we don't want our employees to be harmed when they come to work in our organization. And healthcare, by the way, also is the da most dangerous employer to work for in America if you measure it based on lost days work. Uh, I think both of those are the same cultural issue in healthcare uh, that we have to deal with. Zero Harm has been a, is a book I brought with me, uh, just as affirmation because it was published by McGraw Hill this past year, and we had an opportunity to contribute to the book um, to talk about our experience in getting towards zero harm. And we're not there yet, but we've made tremendous progress as an organization, and we've been recognized by a lot of external validated data related um, industry experts for quality in the past couple of years. One of them is LeapFrog and it's a group that started with large employers uh, frustrated that all hospitals said we're really good and and they justified their price off of saying they were really good and large employers said you can't all really be that good and some people have a low price to say they're high quality and some people have a high price to say high quality so LeapFrog was born out of large employers trying to find a more objective way to measure quality and safety in healthcare. And we have had a straight A for safety for 13 six month safety periods in a row. The very first time we were surveyed we were B and since that time we have been an A. But this little arrow should be about halfway through there. About three years ago, although we had been A's for six periods in a row, we brought in experts from nuclear power and the airline industry because they are thought of in America as being safer industries than healthcare. And we wanted to learn, so what's it like to run a nuclear power plant or what's it like to be in the airline industries? Because most people in my job never have worked outside of the healthcare industry. It takes a long time to become a physician. It takes a long time to be a hospital administrator. Most of us always worked in our own field, so all we know is what we know. Those experts helped us change our culture in the organization. The slide at the top is a uh, benchmarkable data we provide our, our vendor, which was healthcare performance improvement, on serious safety events. And we have reduced serious patient safety events by over 80% in the last two years. I wish I knew how to do that 30 years ago in my career. Um, and I believe that can be done in other hospitals, but it's not being done. And I think that's a problem for our industry. There are nine hospitals in the state of Massachusetts that have had B's or C's in safety from LeapFrog for over four years in a row. It's only about 60 hospitals in the state, so a fair number and even though we pushed this past year uh, to push back at a ballot initiative that was aimed at nurse staffing, and, and we were successful as an industry, in our industry we actually have more B's and C's rated for safety this year than we did last year, which I think is a problem. Um, and, and worthy of work and worthy of talking about. I've been around the country lately. I'm doing my job to push our industry. I'm doing my job to push our industry in the state. I'm doing my job to push our industry nationally. I've spoken in Seattle, Baltimore, Michigan, Florida, twice in Boston, trying to take what we think we've learned how to do in our organization, a combination of Toyota production, lean operational excellence combined with culture of safety out of nuclear power to reduce patient harm and bring that to other organizations um, And uh, because I'm passionate about that work. Blue Cross also measures us not on just the hospital basis, but over in the physician group. And this is a graph from our Blue Cross contract where they measure quality. And Signature has the highest rating for a composite measure for the care of diabetic patients. And that's the part on the left axis. Um, this way is the quality score. We're sitting at the top of their database uh, for quality of the care for diabetics and midpoint in their database relative to cost. We, by the way, have uh, not a totally unique position, but we are the sixth or seventh lowest paid hospital in the state for commercial insurance rates. And we have the equal opportunity of 
the seventh highest percentage of Medicaid in the state. And usually we think of Medicare underpays, Medicaid underpays, and you make it up in margin off of commercial insurance. But because we don't have a lot of commercial insurance in Brockton, we don't have the power to negotiate for higher rates. So we also try to accomplish great results through uh, really efficiency and being higher quality and higher safety. And I believe that if you're high quality, high safety, it will result in better financial performance, which I think we're proving over time. We also are trying to keep people at home and in our system and provide higher and higher quality care. And thanks to the Green family, we were able to open the Green Cancer Center last year. And this is a slide showing the increase in the number of patients we're able to take care of, both in individual patients and, and in infusion visits. The blue line is the first year we started. The red line is fiscal 17. The green line is 18. And the purple line is where we are through four months of this year. And we will beat last year. We are now uh, have recruited three medical oncologists to that team. Uh, all three of them came from Dana-Farber. Uh, the Green Cancer Center is in combination with Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard uh, Faculty Medical Group. Uh, we wouldn't put the Cancer Center together until we thought we had an academic that would be an invested partner because we wanted to remove any emotional barriers to referring patients up into academic medical centers when that was necessary and wanted them to believe they were referring in their system, not out of their system, so there were no barriers to referral into town and no barriers of referring patients who were in town whose infusion therapy could be delivered locally. And so we're keeping more patients local for what we think is high quality healthcare. And to me, one of the best measures is what happens to the insiders. So I was so pleased this past year in looking at our own employee insurance plan, all insiders, all our family members and our staff. We're retaining now 90% of our employees and their families who have cancer are having cancer treatments at our own cancer center, which is is insider's knowledge, I think, is really important. We're also retaining 90% of orthopedic patients, which I'll get to in a second. We're adding new services to the Cancer Center. Um, the radiation changes are high-dose radiation, narrowly focused to be able to do fewer treatments at higher doses, and we're starting those programs. And then uh, Zofigo is a new program that is, I think, the only one in the South Shore but one thing that's not on the slide that's harder to explain is the ability to coordinate care because most of the specialists at Signature are all employed. We can do things that you can't do in community centers very well, but we started a breast cancer treatment program for women who are diagnosed with breast cancer so that they can see their radiation oncologist, their medical oncologist, and their surgeon all on the same day in one visit in our cancer center. So we've taken our employed staff, opened up their schedule, and scheduled one day a week uh, for newly diagnosed breast cancer patients to get their treatment planning done at one place so that they don't have to hear different stories from different people and have uh, what I think typically in the healthcare industry has been uncoordinated care. Also have done a much better job, I think, of growing orthopedics with our relationship with Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and the Harvard Faculty Medical Group. And the number of orthopedic patients after the joint venture with Beth Israel has gone up by 50%, and we have treated uh, somewhere around, I think, 210, 220% more joint patients uh, in our organization than we were treating before. And we've begun to try to reach out of our shop into different parts of our community where we see gaps. And one of those gaps, we believed, was in the treatment of student athletes, both in terms of concussion management as well as athletic trainers. And as we looked at the schools around us, some had full-time athletic trainers, some schools were having a difficult time retaining their full-time athletic trainers, and some had athletic trainers that weren't really trained as athletic trainers. It might have been EMT or other professionals really trying to help schools. So we now have uh, contracted athletic trainers with a number of schools in our area where they're on our payroll. They work in the school and then come over to our orthopedic practice and work with the surgeons. 
and then go back out to the school so they know how our surgeons are going to treat different injuries. They are working with the surgeons frequently enough to improve their quality of care, and then they're out in these schools. And I, I believe it's making a difference in terms of the way we're treating student athletes, and in particular concussion uh, patients. And I, I get the number right, but um, we have treated now 1,500 student athletes uh, with concussion since starting that program. So I believe it is uh, making a difference in our schools. And as we look outside our VIOWAR organization to other places, I think one issue for us to deal with as typical providers has been hospitals and physicians were built over time in buildings so that when you were sick, you came to us. We weren't really structured for keeping you from ever being sick to begin with. You just take adults, adults over the age of 30 or 40, 30% 30 of us are pre-diabetic. Most of us don't know that because it doesn't have a symptom that goes along with it. But pre-diabetes can be treated through diet and exercise. And if you don't treat it, there's a 30% chance you're going to become diabetic within the next few years. Well, how do you actually help that when there's no symptom to drive a patient to come see the physician so that we can screen to begin with? So where are those people? Well, one place I think they are is in great places like the Y because people self-select the Y because they're interested in, in whole health fitness. And so we have a new partnership with the Y. I'm really excited about Vinny's willingness to allow the hospital into their facilities and willingness to partner with them and their great programs. But in, in Bridgewater, we're starting a new healthy living center. We're gonna have a nurse there from the hospital. We're gonna do biometric screenings and we're gonna try to use the WISE great programs to try to help the users of that Y understand where they are with chronic illness and design programs to help them live healthier. We know that if you look at health outcomes, Providers only impact 20% of health outcomes. 80% of our long, 80 of how long we're gonna live is either genetic, or it's our jobs, our income, social policy, and the way we live our lifestyle. 20% is what we actually do with medicine. 80% is what happens outside our organization. And we've reflected on that and believe that, well, our hospital was formed by people in the community who wanted to be healthy. And we can't do that in our buildings. We've got to do that with external partners. So this is one effort with a great external partner. And I'm hoping that we can find a sustainability plan that allows us to move this to the WISE other locations. I'm really excited about what this means for us as well as the Y. The other place you're located is in your employers. It's back to how do we influence people to be healthy. We're doing outreach to employers, trying to take what we've learned with our own employees. We've been working with our own employees doing health screening now for probably seven of the eight years I've been there. I have a cohort of employees that we can show who was at high risk for using health care expenses uh, eight years ago and where they are today and where they were high risk, middle risk, or low risk. And we've tried to help with plan design and incentives to help people eat healthier, live a healthier lifestyle, and actually improve their likelihood of becoming chronically ill. And we have bent the cost curve for our own employees. Our health plan expenses have been flat or down for a number of years. And we believe we should take that expertise out to employers. So we started a wellness program for employers, trying to go to employers interested in learning from that couple of things we've also learned along the way. One is that the disease management being done by insurance companies from a central office doesn't work. It wasn't working for our own employees. HIPAA gets in the way. I can't know which one of my employees actually has a chronic illness, so although I have physicians, I could reach out and try to help them because HIPAA says I can't know that as an employer. So we too, like you, were using disease managers from our insurance company. They weren't really having the phone answered by our employees and really weren't making any impact. So we started hiring health coaches on our own. And so we're essentially doing the same thing with some employer relationships, bringing in a nurse practitioner to the employer's work site one day a week to help them do health coaching with their employees to see if we can help them help their chronic illness employees 
actually reduce morbidity, improve uh, the days they're able to show up at work and able to show up healthy. And I think that and the program with the Y are the most symbolic things we're doing, reaching outside our walls into this community, trying to help people be healthier. And then there's some things we're doing with sort of inside baseball, trying to do a better job of coordinating care. But a few years ago, we uh, went through Jeff to our insurance carrier uh, from our practice and asked for a grant to hire a lean specialist, Toyota Production, somebody that's in, that really works in process improvement. And we took our best process improvement person for two years and put them over at the home health agency. Brockton VA has always been a great partner of ours, willing to take any patient in, in our community. And we wanted to help them improve their quality because we wanted to have the same language to improve handoffs from the hospital to home health and home health back into our physician practice. Uh, that individual now works two days a week for them and two days a week for us so that as we talk about handoffs between the hospital and the home health agency it's the same process improvement person working on both sides of the street and it's really helping us uh, with smoother transitions of care uh, out of the hospital we're also trying to do the same thing in nursing homes we have physicians and nurse practitioners now in that list of nursing homes and are now seeing about 90% of hospital discharges that were signature medical group patients coming into Brockton Hospital, going home to a nursing home, if they go to a nursing home, going to a nursing home where we have a physician or nurse practitioner rounding. That means their documentation is in our electronic medical record. That means when they come back to the physician on an outpatient basis, we have access to everything that happened to them in the nursing home. And that means they have access in the nursing home to our electronic medical record at the hospital. So we are coordinating care again from the hospital to the nursing home. And if the nursing home, they go to home health, we're trying to get them in the VNA where we're also doing process improvement to get them back into the hospital. Uh, I don't believe that we have to own the services, but I do believe we have to coordinate much better than we have t traditionally done in healthcare. And the last thing we've been working on, or one of the last things we've been working on, is the tremendous uh, impact that opiates have had in our community. And if you dial back multiple years, physicians were being taught that we needed to do a better job of managing pain. And the early research, the researchers were saying if you give opiates oxycontin and they have true pain they won't get addicted to it dial back to the last few years we find out that that research was flawed and that a higher percentage of people are addicted but we've got a lot of patients that have been on oxycontin and other pain relievers for a long time some on good maintenance doses and handle well on maintenance doses but we have been working in our primary care practices to dial back the prescription of opiates in our physician practice for people on chronic opiate medications. And so this curve over on the bottom right is the reduction curve. 80,000 patients in our panel of patients, the reduction of opiate ordering by our primary care practices over the last two years as we've gone in and worked with them on helping their patients come off of high doses of opiates. And it's interesting, we're learning that many patients are actually feeling better on lower doses than we ever imagined because that wasn't what the research said but it is now what we're learning to be able to do we're also looking at practice pattern variation among our surgeons who discharge patients and have dialed back significantly the amount of pain medications that people are going home with doing what we think we should be doing in the community. We've increased the uh, pain clinic we have for people on chronic pain that really need more support and have added physicians who are experts in chronic pain. And then most recently have been able to get uh, Dr. Dern, Michael Dern, who some of you know in our community, great physician, retired. What a loss to the community if he had just fully retired. But Mike was willing to leave Fabric practice and go establish an office based addiction treatment center for us over in Abington so that we can start patients on Suboxone and other treatment methodologies to replace Oxycontin. And, and so we intend to build that up in our network through Dr. Dern so that he can initiate treatment and then we can move those patients back into our primary care practices. So he, ha he has now a clinic in Abington. Um, for the treatment of addiction disease, which I think is a great uh, benefit for our community. 
And then uh, last thing I want to mention, a couple of other great partnerships that are going on in our facility. One is the Neighborhood Health Center in February started uh, delivering babies in our institution. As far as I know, I, I don't know if there's ever been a time where they've done OB deliveries at Brockton Hospital, but they're now del doing deliveries. We're excited about having them in our facility. Um, and the Man and Community Center moved from Quincy, opened an office down in Taunton for primary care, asked us to begin providing OB services for them in their Taunton office, and we started that and are beginning to see some patients out of Taunton come over to Brockton Hospital for delivery. And then as we started managing the lives of 18,000 Medicaid patients, we're at full per member per month risk for our Medicaid patients with the help of um, Boston Medical Center. We're doing things like with Father Bills and Main Strings, trying to find a way to help patients who are not really ready for discharge if they're homeless, but would be ready for discharge if they could be supervised non-medically, have a place to go. And we found some of our patients that we were just keeping in the hospital for multiple days because they might have been on IV treatments or might have needed a crutch or might not just be ready to go to the streets. The homeless shelter has always been open, but they closed in the morning. So they pushed people out to the streets because they didn't have staffing to do that and didn't have reimbursement for it. So we are going through an experiment right now, paying them a per diem for four patients a day so that we can discharge patients over to the homeless shelter. They can take that money and hire staff during the day so that they can be open during the day so that we can find a safer place for some of our Medicaid patients to be. We've also added uh, nurses and community workers in our physician practices doing a tremendous amount of outreach for our Medicaid patients trying to help keep them out of our system as we've rehabbed and changed our hospital system over time. So we're trying to find ways to not just be the place that you come when you're sick, but the place that we work with employers and local agencies to see if we can find a way to keep people from getting a chronic illness. And if they have a chronic illness, find a way to manage the chronic illness in a way they actually don't come to see us. Um, that's an odd business model, by the way. Um, well, we're trying really hard uh, to figure out how we better serve this community. And thank you for the tremendous support we've had uh, in doing that. And I'd be happy to answer questions or hear how we could better serve you. Chris. So, Tim, uh, I just wanted to thank you for your leadership there. I think you've got a on the uh, Chris, thank you. And uh, you know, there's, a lot, I think, a lot of subtle things we do in this community that only insiders will ever know. But some of that is to provide access to health care that just would not be accessible to people in this community. Were we not employing physicians and say, take everybody regardless of their ability to pay, regardless of the insurance plan they have, take them, we, we will take care of this community, we'll figure out the money on the back side. That access is tremendous to this community and multiple specialties of physicians that I know in my heart would not be available if we weren't finding a way to make that happen. Um, and I believe that's a tremendous benefit uh, to the people in the community. Yes, sir. So I had a question about the nursing question. And I know that they're gonna probably be on a ballot at some point again. Are you guys preparing to fight that again? And because again, they're planning on more money, more ads, and well, I hope it's a gone for a while. It may come back. Um, and from my perspective, what I believe that we should be doing as an industry is that we should be working on quality and safety as an industry. And I believe that it was 
a ballot initiative that came from some people because they work in some organizations that are not staffed appropriately, and there was some truth to that. I don't believe legislation was the cure to that because that's going to take some organizations that had, like us, I believe, very high quality, very high safety, and tell us how to do our business. And I thought it was going to pull us down, not help us. But that doesn't mean the industry still doesn't need to work on quality and safety. And I think what we need to do in preparation for another ballot initiative is see that all hospitals in the state have a safety grade of A and see that all hospitals in the state are working on culture of safety and reducing patient harm. And then I don't think we would need the initiative to begin with, which I think we're, we're it's the right thing to do. Yes, Tom. The same drug companies that are being sued by a lot of different states. Um, yeah, they were funded, unfortunately, before the internet came along, where it was easier now to pull the original studies. They were funded by the drug companies, and now those drug companies have a lot of states suing them for that work. Kim, one of the things that I deal with every day is helping people plan for the uh, health care costs in retirement and long, long term care. Um, most people are not aware of the limitations of Medicare, and they're not aware of how long-term care is funded or how many people are using Medicaid uh, for, their, for their final years uh, for health care. Can you kind of touch on where that falls on the spectrum of, of you know, what you're working on uh, going forward? Is it something that's on everybody's radar? Because I saw in your additional services that you're giving people financial advice or financial resources um, guidance. Um, so how is, how is that being addressed? It's probably nothing more confusing to people who no longer work than Medicare and all the options that they have to try to sort out and the medications they're on and which plan's going to keep their medications this year and which plan is not going to keep their medications and how they manage their retirement. I frankly don't think we're totally up to the task um, as providers. We don't do as good a job of that as I would like to do. We have added social work into our primary care practices. And I'm hoping that over time the social workers and community workers are closer to being able to help patients with enough information to help them make better choices. I would raise up for you two options I think seniors ought to consider, at least from my perspective as an insider. One is when you mention Medicaid and Medicare. There's a great clinic just down the street that's opened up that I got to tour about three weeks ago, the PACE Clinic, which is aimed at Patients over 55, they qualify for nursing home benefits, but are safe to be at home. And PACE clinics out of the Harbor Medical Group in Mattapan have established a site down here just for those patients with physicians, physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, pharmacists that really aim at those patients to keep them in their home, a rare program. I think there are less than 150 around the country, so we have a tremendous asset down the street for patients that are um, low resources, going to be Medicare and Medicaid to keep them out of the home, and it's a great resource in our community. I don't even think all of our providers know enough about as an option. And the other are Medicare Advantage plans. So people have to decide do they want traditional insurance or not, but Medicare Advantage plans have been designed around additional resources to help chronically ill elders stay out of the health care system with more resources than traditional Medicare, which is, to me, unstructured and unmanaged and uncoordinated. But Advantage plans have the ability to really help seniors, I believe, coordinate their care, um, which I think are great options. Yes. I was going to ask another confusing, boring question about health insurance and costs and all that, but one thing that struck me Kim, um, in a lot of programs that you're describing, they seem to be uh, differentiators. They seem to be non-traditional, out-of-the-box type thinking than some of the outreach programs and, and things that you've implemented. Could you maybe just touch on, because I know it's probably a very elaborate answer, but can you touch on the creative process that, uh, that farms those ideas out and, and uh, 
uh, not necessarily how they make the rubber hit the road, but just how you flush those out and, and get them into action. That is a great question and one that I would say if there's anybody here, Steve, um, that, has, um, that has advice for us about innovation, I would love it as a CEO to sit down with you about how you actually do that. Here's some of the things we've tried. And Jeff has been a great partner of mine trying to figure this out. But as I look at Signature when I came in, a group of people that did not traditionally go outside the organization to seminars, they traditionally didn't read a lot in our trade press or outside of our trade press. And I found an organization that had been hunkered down for a number of years trying to find a way to survive as a high Medicaid facility, but really hadn't looked outside the walls. So we've sent people to conferences, and then Jeff and I decided one year, we'll put $100,000 out of the foundation over into a bucket and allow anybody that wants it, manager, non-manager, physician, anybody that wants to tap into groupings of 25, up to $25,000 as an innovation fund, Here's a pot of money. Just come give us a plan. Tell us how you're going to use it. What do you want to innovate? And how, how would you like to trial it? And then be willing to come back in and tell us, did it work or not? Well, that worked for a little while for some early adopters who tapped into the money, and then it just sort of trailed off. And then uh, my wife and I have established a benchmarking fund. So we created an endowment, the two of us, that throws off eight to ten thousand dollars a year. Uh, I first tried to to get people to apply for the benchmarking fund saying, I'll pay out of my own pocket for you to go to another hospital in the country to bring back best practice and have anybody use the money. Second year, we tried again, it didn't have anybody use the money. So now we created the same money, we kept it in the endowment, but we're recognizing anybody that has gone out, so I'm not using it to pay for them but they can apply for an award. So we did award some great programs last year that were very innovative for people left our organization and benchmark um, some improvement, in particular a lung cancer screening program and then the care of cardiac patients on warfarin and blood thinners. Both of those great programs and then another OB program on reducing mortality of OB uh, mothers by working on providing less blood. Uh, after after a c-section but we just finished the first quarter and I have one application for the award this quarter I think and so I'm struggling again I am at, we we are working hard I think internally to try to figure out how we activate really smart people in our organization to be more innovative and and even including investing my own personal cash, and I'm struggling with what to do. And I, if you have advice uh, that you could share, yeah, I think you're a tremendously innovative company that's right here, right here in Brockton. But any of you that have any advice offline, I would love. To, how do you do more of that? Because I believe that healthcare has to transform itself. And Just a yeah. Our office supply business is going towards the paperless office. The paperless office will probably put the old W.D. Mason out of business. But how about the day when we have a cancer list and we don't need the Carol John Steve Green cancer list? That would be such a, if anybody can figure that out, that's the answer. You know, oh, isn't it? put you out of business. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be a good day. The day we go out of business when there's no cancer would be a good day. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Any other questions? Thank you for the support you give to this organization.